Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Hernando County, and I'm here today with my regular co-host, Lily Browning, who is the Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. I finally got that right. I think yeah, it took me a while. It's but it's program good. coordinator, but I don't want to be picky. You, you got it pretty close. <laughs> I'll keep working on it and practicing. I'll write it down next time and read it off. How's that? It's on every email I ever send you. <laughs> I don't read half of them anyway. So, <laughs> and today we have a special guest. Yi Lin is here Yay. and she is also with the University of Florida Extension and she is our district water agent. Is that correct? Is that your correct title or what is your title? I don't Close enough, my title is pretty long. It's a regional specialized agent in water resources. Ooh. I would have had to write that one down. <laughs> I wouldn't. I already wrote it down. Regional specialized agent in water resources. See, there you go. Yeah, I would have had to write that one down. So, <laughs> Yi Lin works with water, and Lily works with water. She works mm -hmm. for the utilities department. Mm -hmm. And I work with everything I do in one way or another ties in with water. So if you guys have any questions about water today, please feel free to ask because we have all the experts on here today. Mm -hmm. Elin knows all about septic tanks and, <laughs> and all That's those. That's right. Testing your I well water. By the way, my well water was fine. Oh, great news. <laughs> yes, at least it was way back when you did the program. And um, I got my water testing kit and my well water was safe. So that's great news. So if anyone is watching this uh, virtual plant clinic and you are on private wells, uh, we highly recommend you to test your well at least once a year for some basic parameters. Uh, most important is bacteria followed by lead and the nitrate. And where could somebody get that testing done? Because I know here in Hernando County, mm -hmm. I believe the health department takes care of that. So if you contact the Hernando County Health Department, they can help set you up with testing your water for mostly bacteria and pathogens, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it really depends. Uh, just like Bill mentioned, uh, uh, some counties, the uh, local health department, uh, they uh, they offer the water testing, but some local county health departments are just the capacity. They are not able to facilitate the water testing. Then we suggest you to look for a state certified water testing lab to get your well water tested. And to find out that, uh, uh, I can drop a link so it might be easier for you to access that. State of Florida, it's called the knee lab. For it. So you okay. can find, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, if you put that in private chat, I could put it in the comments, or maybe you could put it in the comments. I'm not sure exactly what you see on your screen. Uh, I see on my screen. I can see a common session. I also see a private. Okay. Oh, I can. I I don't think I can do comment. Just put in the chat so you can get it to the audience. Just have to admit, I only use uh, this platform a handful of times. I really like this platform. It's just so interactive and the arrangement, I like it. But I'm still trying to figure out all the ins and outs because I'm a Zoom person. <laughs> Over the last few years, I'm really adept to Zoom. Me too. When he has me host for him, it's kind of like, <laughs> you know, it's usually pretty good, but there are some things that are a little different, especially yeah. screen sharing. Oh, I'm learning new things about this platform every week, and they're constantly adding new things to it also. So that keeps it even more interesting. Buddy's here this morning. Buddy's one of our regular listeners, and he's from Tallahassee. Yes, you finally got it right. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, good morning. So see, we have viewers from all over the place that join us every week. Yep, and we've got Broward County, Lee County, um, and believe it or not, Hernando County. <laughs> Pinellas County. Uh-huh, yep. 
Um, well, while we have you, Lynn, um, I have been getting questions lately um, from people with questions regarding septic tanks. Mm -hmm. I know here in Hernando County, I think as of January 2017, you, if you are building a new home, you have to install the nitrate reducing septic tank. And now my question is, I have heard, I don't know whether that's true, that if you have an acre or more, you are not bound by that. You can get a regular old uh, septic tank. Yeah, that's a, uh, it's mostly correct. Because uh, uh, for spring basins, uh, they develop uh, a blueprint called BMAP, which is a basin management action plan. So, and uh, within BMAP, there's a specific language because uh, identified septic systems uh, are the major nitrogen loading to groundwater. Of course, it depends on some regions may not be septic. So let me take one step back. For the BMAP, they develop an inventory, a pie chart, just to identify the nitrogen loading sources. If septic systems uh, contribute more than 20% of the nitrogen loadings, uh, then there need to be remediation plans. And for the remediation plans, at this point, uh, it focus on called a PFA. So that's called a priority focus area. Mm -hmm. So within the spring shed, so spring shed, it's a, it's a big, big basin. And there's uh, identified priority focus area, which it's uh, more vulnerable, or we need more protection for our groundwater. So within that area, you have old, uh, old septic systems on a land smaller than one acre. If it fails, you cannot get it repaired. Um, and if you have a one acre lot, you want to build a new house, then you either connect to sewer or you upgrade to nitrogen reducing septic systems. Because for conventional septic systems, um, the, it just conventional septic systems are not designed to remove nitrogen. That's also why, like um, in most B maps, uh, septic systems uh, contribute is a major nitrogen loading contributor. They are, they were created for um, human health. That's what correct. Is. Yeah. Created for to keep pathogens um, away, you know, mm -hmm. from where we would come in contact with them. They were yeah. created to uh, reduce nitrogen. Um, so in my area, which is all usually half acre lots that are being built like crazy. And even though we're right by one of uh, my my department's waste treatment plants. We are not, <laughs> it's for another community. We don't hook up to it. We have wells and septics. Um, and I see all the new houses have these green domes in the yard. Um, is, is that part of the new septic system? Uh, it depends, because I've seen advanced the septic systems. So I say advanced, they're just a nitrogen removing septic systems. Mm -hmm. so, so from the yard, not that much difference. So I've um, seen so some. Maybe they're getting uh, gas or something. Maybe that's what those are, gas tanks. Yeah, it could also be pump because uh, advanced some advanced septic systems so they have uh, uh, pumps. So one advanced uh, called ATU advanced treatment unit, uh, it's kind of mimic wastewater treatment plant because uh, the septic, so it just uh, it's anaerobic. But to remove nitrogen, you need that aerobic environment uh, to denitrify it. So that's why they mimic septic, uh, they mimic wastewater treatment plant, in, okay. introduce the pump and uh, just stir it and introduce air into it. So in that way, it creates the aerobic environment to facilitate the denitrification. So, yeah, so the purpose is to have the nitrogen gas off. Mm -hmm. is that, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but and, still the um, anaerobic portion that kills the pathogens, correct? Uh, anaerobic, correct. Yes. Yeah. The stinky parts. <laughs> <laughs> and I always say it's a, a functional septic system, actually. It's not that bad because it's anaerobic without oxygen because it's right. kind of kill all the smell. So when you have like more function septic, 
then it gets uh, smelly and uh, even in the tank the liquid gets muddy uh, a functional septic system we all knew that because we 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 taught we taught a lot uh, several septic system classes so the bottom is the sludge layer and mm -hmm. above that is the liquid layer and then it's the scum it's just the oil layer and the liquid layer you it should be it's like tea color it should be relatively clear it's not that like really muddy nasty mm -hmm. like we usually imagine so if you see it's just so nasty like you mm -hmm. open the tank it's a powerful smell just hit you or roaches just come out <laughs> it, probably it, it needs a little bit more attention <laughs> you you've created some ptsd let's go to <laughs> 1978 <laughs> in historic town florida my mother had just bought a house you know built <clears throat> probably right after world war ii just this I'm trying to think of a better word than shack but anyway <laughs> um historic the, the first thing we had to do is um she had to get a new well and septic tank but the septic tank and it was small it looked like the size of a cooler i think Ink, but it was maybe three feet from the house out the back door and i do just remember when they dug it up and i'm 11 years old just happened to walk out then when they dug it up and took the cement lid off and all these roaches came pouring out and <laughs> yeah so that was uh covered over and she got a new well and septic tank pretty much immediately the first people we met in the south was the um well and septic tank man <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and interestingly enough his son's name is on my well now <laughs> so. wow family business that's great that's right. yes yeah i've lived in a number of houses with septic systems and i've lived through septic problems before so if anybody else has had them i understand how you feel yeah and you notice, and Bill, you notice, Bill, this time we just dove right into poop this time. We didn't even dance around it. it is no, no. Of hey, you have me. You yeah. didn't see my crown here. I'm the queen of poop factory. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, that's a recurring theme here at the plant clinic is we always, the conversation always gets around to poop eventually, <laughs> whether it be insects or now septic systems or anything else in between. Oh, see, I should join you more often. This is just right in my alley. <laughs> so, yeah, septic systems generally work really well. But I think a lot of people, maybe especially people who are new to the area, because we have so many people moving to Fernando County and all over Florida, really. So you move here, you get a house that has a septic system, and it's this thing that's underground somewhere in the yard you're not even really sure where and you just ignore it and figure well i'm never going to have a problem with it it's going to take care of itself forever and that's not really true there is a certain amount of maintenance you want to do even if you have one of the traditional septic systems like most of us still do you do need to get a pump every couple of years so elin what are like the most important maintenance things that people want to do instead of just ignoring and forgetting their septic systems. Because if you forget it, one day it's going to fail and you're going to be really, really unhappy. Yeah. It's right out of mind. It'll come back to haunt you. <laughs> That's right. If you don't pay attention to it now, you forget it. Now, later you will pay for it. And uh, I, it just uh, like septic systems, it doesn't require extensive maintenance. It does require some attention to that, just like Bill mentioned. You want to pump it. Uh, um, um, it depends on the size. It depends on the water use. But generally, we say every three to five years, uh, you need to pump your septic systems. Uh, and another, it's actually, it's very basic daily maintenance. It's just be mindful what goes to your septic systems. So here's my favorite part. I just like to do a quick quiz. So, cause I usually people just ask me, then what can I put into the septic systems? Then I will say, let's start from the bathroom first. 
So your bathroom toilet, you follow the four P principles or four P theories. So I would like to ask the audience, what are these four P's? <laughs> Anybody hey, have any so ideas? Hard. Just put it in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> One of them is Bill and I's favorite subject, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning. We dive into four piece. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, we have anybody guessing? Or what are the four P's? People are thinking about it. Put in your toilet. Yeah, um, I give you a hint, just like Lily mentioned. <laughs> One P, probably the first two P's, we are all very familiar with that. Yeah, that kind of happens <laughs> by itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a guess what's the other two P's? Um, so maybe it's they're, maybe, maybe they're all out there staring at their septic tanks now. Yeah, I them I'm watching the comments, none are coming in for some reason. I don't know. Oh. She got three of them. Oh, yeah. That's dun, dun, dun. right. That's right. That's a uh, three of the four piece. The last P is not that common. We usually it's uh, like three P, but I heard this talk put the fourth P there. I think it makes so much sense. It's so gross. So it's puke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a uh, paper like all, all the. Uh, number one business, number two business, and mm -hmm. toilet paper. I do want to emphasize it's toilet paper because uh, you go to grocery now, you can see they have these uh, uh, wipes. It's called uh, flushable wipes. Um, just keep in mind the flushable wipes, uh, they, it just, uh, they can be flushed down to the toilet. So in other words, they may not be clogged in your toilet, but that doesn't mean it will biodegrade in your tank. So I used to intern in wastewater treatment plant because my background is civil engineering. So when I interned in wastewater treatment plant, we got these like phone calls, this lift station didn't work, that one didn't work. Then operators went to the lift stations. They opened the lift stations because when the lift station is clogged, there's no way to unclog it unless you manually open it and clean it. So these operators open the lift station. So one thing we find a lot of clogged the lift station it was uh, wipes. Mm -hmm. So like those are baby wipes, uh, uh, flushable wipes, makeup wipes, and also diapers. Uh, like when I enter in the wastewater treatment plant, we find that a lot. So just keep in yes. mind, it it doesn't clog your toilet, doesn't mean it won't clog somewhere else. And for utility users, you have like public utility, mm -hmm. these operators uh, to maintain the system on your behalf. But when you are on septic systems, uh, so when the system, the tank is clogged, or even worse, it's when your drain field is clogged, because drain field is perforated mm -hmm. pipes, usually it's PVC pipes. When they are clogged, there's nothing to clog it. I've seen some Facebook posts that said, oh, you use Drano or anything like for the, uh, for your pipe, it can unclog your drain field. It won't. Once mm -hmm. it's clogged, the only way to unclog it is to replace your drain field. And to replace your drain field can be very expensive. Mm -hmm. I was talking to one homeowner last year, they spent $8,000 to replace the drain field. And if we go Not back- no, just a drain field, uh, replace okay. that. And if we go back, just Lily mentioned earlier, it's the BMAP, Basin Management Action Plans. Uh, so like for these uh, one acre lot within PFA, priority focus area, your system failed, you may not able to repair it. You will need to upgrade to a new septic system. Mm -hmm. So you just, it's a, just a little bit of maintenance uh, go a long way. And I will say it's if your utility provide uh, a system, conventional septic system upgrade or sewer, to, oh, excuse me, uh, subject to sewer connection, especially they provide the, the connection fees or incentives, uh, please, please take advantage of that because we know down the road, it's getting more and more expensive. Yeah, Bill knows more about that than I do, even though it's my department. We do have a septic to sewer program, but for very, you know, we're starting out 
you know, very specific areas. All I know is my boss says I'm not allowed to answer questions about it. I have to send it to her or, or you know, one of our engineers because they really know what's going on with that. Bill may know even a little more. I know within the priority focus area, there's an area in Spring Hill that is first chosen that is going to go septic to sewer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I know there's some cost for the homeowner, um, but we're trying to mitigate that cost, you know, with grants and things as much as possible. So, I mean, what do you know about it, Bill? Very little. I know that there are in different areas uh, grant programs, either through the uh, state government or local governments. You really, because we have people on here from all over Florida, really, right, right, right. you really need to check with your local government to find out exactly what your situation is. And if you're in Hernando, you would know by now if you were in that area, mm -hmm. you would have heard from us. So, um, yes, because I know in some areas there was grant money where you could get your septic system replaced, even if it was still working, you can get it replaced with one of the uh, new and improved ones. And either it was free or it was very inexpensive for the homeowner. I know it helped out a lot, but mm -hmm. a lot of those grants funds have run out. Yeah. So it depends quite a bit. And it really depends on where you live, whether you're in a BMAP area or priority focus area. Yeah. So yeah. I live in Spring Hill yeah. and I am in a priority focus area here. And we also still own a home over in Deltona in Volusia County. And I am under the Blue Springs B map over there in a priority focus area there also. Mm -hmm. So I'm under two different PFAs. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> um, so like we have Jim Norman on here earlier who says he's from Volusia County. Mm -hmm. So Jim, if you're interested in how you're affected by all this, you really need it. What department would they contact with their local government? Uh, health department? Do health departments generally cover all the septics? I would, I I would you know, if, if you have questions about septic to sewer, contact your water and sewer department. Now, you can't call up and say, hey, hook me up to sewer. I wish it could work that way, but um, you know, yeah, choose these neighborhoods because that's a, you know, multi-million dollar project probably. So, you know, they choose you know, a couple dozen houses or whatever to do at one time. That's a lot of work on our end. You can't just hook individuals up <laughs> and not the whole neighborhood. So. Yeah, that's also just the feasibility. So, so it's uh, like because for utilities, uh, they're, A, it's uh, if their current wastewater treatment ca capacity can take additional flow into it. Right. Another, it's uh, infrastructure. Ooh the mm -hmm. proximity of uh, like the pipeline to expand. So I know for most utilities, uh, they are doing some feasibility analysis, uh, just see how to make it possible. So they consider different factors. One so already mentioned it's uh, like uh, the capacity of wastewater treatment plant and the proximity. And uh, the other one is also the density, like this community, how many tanks. Mm -hmm. So if you like, you know, uh, you are within the spring shed, uh, contact your local department, like government, uh, could be utility and for Volusia, I know it's uh, their environmental and the natural resource department and also your local health department. Cause there's a reason change. It's uh, uh, DOH because septic systems uh, are under Florida Department of Health, uh, but now it's moved to Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So mm -hmm. this part, it's uh, I'm, I know it's at the state level they finished the transition. Oh, they are in the transition. So I'm not sure for the local level. Uh, I will still start from your local Department of Health and the local government department. And the one thing I do want to emphasize here, it's a simple because we were talking about the nitrogen, we mentioned how it's going to uh, deteriorate the groundwater, deteriorate our springs. Uh, another, it's also very important, it's your health. Mm -hmm. Because we know we get our water from groundwater. The elevated nitrogen can be a concern. Uh, another issue, it's uh, 
a malfunction septic system. So we know then we know it's not doing its job. Septic systems are designed to, to treat bacteria. If your system is not working properly, especially some system like your drain field, you feel so soggy, and after a storm, and the water cannot drain, then that's a that's a big concern. Then that standing water can have a uh, bacteria. And if you have a well, because most septic system users, they also use private wells for home consumption, then that bacteria may find a way uh, to your drinking water and put the uh, household at risk. So it's just a whole picture I want to mention. It's A, it's from the environmental perspective. We do want to have water and pretty healthy water for our next generation. But meanwhile, we also want to protect our health and also our pocket. As we know, when replace a septic system it can be very expensive. No, yes, and it's no. only going to get more expensive. You mentioned Drano and stuff not working. What about Ridex? Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you, Lily, for mentioning that. Uh, I even met some septic system pumpers. Uh, they will tell homeowners, it's a, uh, hey, to maintain your septic system, you know, just put Redex. And some even tell you, just put yeast. A spoon of yeast every week, flush it onto the toilet, you're good to go. So I hate to be the bad news person here. I'm, I'm afraid to tell you that's not true. That's a myth. So for your septic system, because it's uh, the anaerobic in, uh, uh, environment uh, and it's using its natural occurring bacteria to break down the organic matters in the tank. So in other words, there's already a group of bacteria inside your tank. So some joke I usually make. So I hope I'm not offending any teenagers, but you should say it just <laughs> like teenagers. So there's already a group of uh, bacteria in the tank. And uh, like yeast, it's another type of bacteria. You just introduce another group of bacteria into the tank. So like I said, like teenagers, they may get not get along. So you <laughs> introduce another group of bacteria. A is uh, the old group natural occurring bacteria, which is working to break down all the organic matters uh, got killed by the new bacteria, or mm. the environment is too hostile. The new group of bacteria cannot survive, so they just die. So in that way, you waste the money for any additives. But if occurring natural occurring bacteria killed, then it put your uh, septic system at risk. And uh, this is uh, the type like yeast and uh, some other types is uh, like chemicals. You introduce chemicals like Drano, that kind of thing. So that really like harm the natural occurring bacteria. So the best practice is just the less is more. So like for the toilet, you follow the four P's and for your uh, kitchen. So the best way to do it, uh, you just do not use your kitchen sink as a trash can. Try to eliminate the garbage disposal as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And another thing we tend to forget is fat. So it's like milk. If you have a milk you haven't finished, or you are frying bacon, and of all the bacon grease, you just pour it down to the drain. So eventually, it's just gonna be the layer at the uh, at the uh, your septic system. And again, from the perspective of utility, I think Lily is familiar with that. Utility now it's facing a really big struggle. A, it's the wipes. Another, it's the fat. Yep. So it's just really. Yeah, they call them fat birds. Yeah. <laughs> the, the clogged, it's, it is those flushable wipes. It's the baby wipes. It's the diapers. It's the feminine products. It's the, um, and all the grease. They can, so you may say, well, it's a municipal system. I don't have to worry about it. You do have to worry about it if your whole neighborhood, you know, um, is without water because they had to dig an entire street up to fix this problem. So, and that's not fun for our workers <laughs> either. If you ever, you know, um, we need all types of workers and utilities, but I just want to warn you, collections is nowhere near as nice as distribution. Okay, <laughs> let's just put it that way. <laughs> but yes, you're right. We don't think about all the things. And when I bought my house, it came with a garbage disposal. Mm -hmm. And even the house inspectors said, you know, I we have one also. They would not ever 
give garbage disposals to people with septic tanks. That just really makes no sense whatsoever. And so I barely, <laughs> barely ever used it. Now we don't, it broke. And now I have a whole new sink. So, you know, and we didn't get one replaced. And what I do with the grease and, you know, from meat and all that, I have the, maybe the colander, you know, you pour it in. I have a bowl under that. I don't pour it down the sink. I collect it in that bowl. And then this goes back to our recycling program. I know a lot of people get upset that um, our program in the county doesn't recycle glass anymore. Well, kind of, I at least give it a couple of lives in that I use a pasta sauce jar to put the grease in. When that pasta sauce jar is full, then I, you know, wrap it up and put it in the trash. Boy, we do the same thing. Hmm? We do the same thing too. <laughs> and yeah. Because I accidentally came across online, there's like a Facebook page of people who do that and you show off your grease jars. <laughs> We should give awards for that. Utilities <laughs> department should give them a prize or something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, heck, years ago, they would save it and cook with it. So, and maybe some people still do. Okay. Bacon grease, yeah. Yeah. Bacon grease is great to cook with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still do that. I'm not sure if <laughs> any our like U of I best family and the consumer sciences agent will give me another talk because apparently <laughs> my eating habit, it's not the healthiest way let's put it this way <laughs> i have a lot to improve because they are amazed just sometimes of my cooking style probably too much sodium and too much grease but i don't know you know all these additives make food taste better okay that's not university based okay i have to put a disclaimer here it's uh, my personal habit which really need to get improved well it's great when you're camping and you cook the bacon and you pull the bacon off and then you cook the scrambled eggs in the bacon grease. Now, if Wendy Lynch was on here, we'd have to tell her to like turn off her, her uh, <laughs> speaker for a moment or two. <laughs> That's, um, you know, you exactly. Made a good point of not putting, um, well, any cat litter, but especially the clumping cat litter hmm. in your uh, mode <laughs> as well. Yeah, obviously you don't want to put clumping cat litter down the sink. Or I remember when I was growing up in Maryland, and maybe this is more of a northern thing, but like all the potato peelings and care peelings and everything all got stuffed down the sink and then you turn on the disposal and that's where it all went. You know, that's oh, perfect that. for composting. So Absolutely. it's like yes. <laughs> put a my, compost. Was my compost bin. Yes. Right. The design. Well, I mean, there are grinders and stuff. Instead of putting it through the compactor or not the compactor the what is it disposal yeah. that binds it all up have one on the counter put it through there put it in your compost bin there you go it's all cut up and ready for your compost bin so absolutely yes compost it don't put it down the sink Mm -hmm. I that's I know some I learned from our mass gardener volunteers. Uh, mm -hmm. They usually just put a bin, just all they they some of them they do Ziploc composting. So whatever they have that day, like the banana peels or uh, potato mm -hmm. peels, they put it into the Ziploc bag, and they use a blender. They designate a blender just to grind it because they just uh, accelerate the composting process. Mm -hmm. Then once it's done it, it takes i don't know how long it takes i forgot bill do you have any idea how long they usually take uh, about i forgot i, I don't know how you do it if you're putting it outside in a bin or if you're just keeping it yeah I they have, just next to the kitchen mm -hmm. we, we it, it, it all depends if you have a compost bin like i do where you just add to it bit by bit by bit it can take quite a while for things to break down mm -hmm. if you build a bin and you get like 10 bags of ground up oak tree or maple tree leaves and grass clippings and all the stuff all at once and build a great big pile all at once and get the moisture just perfect, get it fluffed up where there's plenty of air inside. You can make a compost in as little as two weeks. Nice. That's so anywhere great. from two weeks to six months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was telling Bill that um, our recycling coordinator Carmen, uh, Bruno, and I are going to see some kids at a local elementary school today to talk about composting because they have 
I didn't tell you, Bill, they made some fantastic compost. I took a picture of it in Carmen's oh. hand, the most beautiful compost um, I've ever seen. But anyway, you can't see my whole outfit, but I've got green, I've got leaves and green, and I have green pants. I, Carmen and I, Carmen is going to wear all brown at this event. He is Carbon Carmen, and I am Leafy Lily. I am <laughs> the nitrogens. So we will talk about what material is considered carbon, what is considered nitrogen. So mm -hmm. just a little fun we're going to have today <laughs> with kids and composting. And I have some pictures to share. Corey sent some pictures of his strawberries in. And hopefully, yeah, you can see that okay. And he was wondering how they looked, if the vegetative growth looked good. They look good. Now, I do see one strawberry, the one on the right, that looks like it has some kind of rot on it. But the rest of them look good. And... Um... He's got this picture here too. Overall, they look really good. I know the weather has been very good for growing strawberries, almost a little bit too warm. I think they like it a little bit cooler than what it's been this winter, but no damaging freezes or really bad weather. Um, you wanna keep checking those strawberries for spider mites. Spider mites are a really common problem with strawberries. You may have to spray with a fungicide if you start getting a lot of fungal problems on the strawberries. But it looks like whatever you're doing, you're doing pretty well. And they'll keep producing until end of April, beginning of May, all depending on the weather. If it gets really hot really early this spring and really rainy and really humid also, you're going to have a lot of disease problems. That's what usually takes out strawberries. And a lot of people, I see a lot of questions on Facebook, people who want to grow strawberries year round. They want to buy strawberries once and plant them and keep them growing for 10 years and getting strawberries all the time. They're annuals. <laughs> it doesn't work like that here in Florida. You're in Florida now. <laughs> doesn't work like that. People grow them as annuals here. So you plant them in October-ish and they're done by April or May-ish. And that's they may not even last quite that long. It's really, really hard to keep them alive during the summer because it's hot, it's humid, it's rainy, you get a lot of diseases, a lot of insects, and you may be really um, disappointed by let's say June or July or so. Your strawberries will most likely not survive. And then the problem is what a lot of people want to do is they want to pour on water and fertilizer and insecticides and fungicides. And for strawberries, that's probably not going to help. They're probably still going to die. And now you put all those chemicals into the environment and we don't want to see that happen either. Those chemicals all cost money. They're not free. So now you're out the money also. So plan on growing strawberries as an annual during the winter just like the commercial people down in Plant City do. They seem to do pretty well at it. And there's they a reason the strawberries in there. March. There's a reason that the festival is in March. Um, because of that's when when they're ready here. Did you see Bill? Um I saw last night, so I don't know what time. I know what channel. It's um Fox thirteen here in Tampa Bay. They are JG Farm, JG Ranch. Here I saw the, that this morning and Jeff was on there with them and he did really, really well. Okay. And their we'll probably, again, probably the five o'clock hour or something. No, they kept popping on all this morning. Oh, okay. Charlie Belcher was there. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And talking, they have a uh, U-Pick. Well, I guess after a while it's a U-Pick, but they've had strawberries. I don't know if they still have blueberries. They still do that. I know they do all kinds of vegetables. They have strawberries right now. They have jalapeno peppers. They have lettuces mm -hmm. and a few other vegetables. And like Nancy points out about the prices going up, he did mention that I believe even their prices had to go up because his cost for everything, the fertilizer and everything else, the, the strawberry plants, everything that goes into it have gone up by like 20% this year. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry, prices on air. Are going up <laughs> as of February too. It's just happening everywhere. I went yeah. to a strawberry pickup 
is I felt because it started in December. Does the season start earlier? Because I went there in December, early December. Okay, probably not early. The second week in December, and it's just all the strawberries. Where was it? Uh, in Central Florida.、Hmm. It is starting a little bit earlier because in the past you would usually get the very first good-looking strawberries just in time for Christmas. But now the you pick places are opening as early as like Thanksgiving in November, and I'm、oh. wondering how on earth did they get strawberries that quickly? It's the new varieties of strawberries, and if the weather cooperates, you can have an early harvest that's a really really big harvest. But some years the weather is just absolutely terrible, and strawberries are in short supply and they're even more expensive.、Mm, yeah. For my you pick up experience, I was like,、mm, it might be cheaper just to buy it in the grocery <laughs> store. But it was fun. It was so much fun to pick up some strawberries. And I was also told that this blueberry season will be early too. So blueberries are coming up, and then blackberries after that. Nice. Yeah. What happens? Yeah, we we have the what Florida does is have blueberries before anywhere one else. That's their commercial niche and. So then, by what May, when Georgia starts、mm. having commercial blueberries, then ours open up for you pick. So that you know, it's like that April time frame that we're the only place you can get blueberries from. <laughs> so <clears throat> it depends. It depends on how large the grower is, if they pick it and sell it commercially, so it ends up in the little plastic packages at the grocery store. Or if they focus to specialize just on you pick. And while we're talking about such things, on both of our Facebook pages, as well as on Hernando County Government YouTube, you will find a pre-recorded program that Bill and I did. I barely did. It was mostly Bill. Um, <laughs> um, on what could go wrong with fruit and vegetable, you know, with growing fruits and vegetables. So you might want to check for that. We just there's a lot that can、it. go wrong with them. We just pre-recorded it last Tuesday,、um, and now it's available on both forums on Facebook as well as YouTube. And、uh, this afternoon, very soon,、um, there will be another program I did. I did on my own, <laughs>、um, protecting pollinators from the cold. That was a pre-recorded、mm-hmm. one. I actually taught it in person at. Our Hernando County Library yesterday, but I also right after Bill and I finished pre-recording, I had that PowerPoint finished, and I figured I'm not going to waste all this makeup on my face. I am going to record this other program. <laughs> so, well, I would zoom anyway. Why don't I just go ahead and knock it out real quick?、So、it'll be available、um, early this afternoon too. <laughs> so we have a question on here about what is the best time to start tomatoes from seeds. Depending on exactly where you live, the best time is now, right now, today. <laughs> I just started mine this past yeah, weekend.、Right、yeah, yeah, let's bit, go. I was a little bit later. I try to start mine here in Central Florida, Hernando County, the week between Christmas and New Year's, because that way you get a good early start. Tomato seeds will come up. You have them started in little pots. You can take good care of them. If it gets cold at night, you bring them in the garage or bring them inside the kitchen or wherever.、Um, you can pot them up so as they get bigger, you put them in bigger and bigger pots, and that way in the spring, when it's time to put them in the garden, you have nice, big, healthy tomato plants all ready to go in the garden. So now is the time for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. Oh, eggplants.、Mm-hmm. I like eggplants. I grew eggplant. I grew the、um, the long, skinny white ones. Oh.、Mm-hmm. And they did really, really well. I got them. They didn't survive the summer, but they usually don't. But I got a lot of them off of just a few plants. They were really good.、So、wow. Time to start thinking about vegetables, which is an unusual thought process if you're here from up north. The time to not think about it is. <laughs> Uh, Mid June through August, <laughs> really.、Mm. <laughs> Other than thinking about、um, your fall crops that you're going to have. And some people do grow tomatoes over the winter, 
And during a winter like this, where we haven't gotten any really devastating freezes here in central Florida, it works. Other years where we get devastating freezes during the winter here in central Florida, your tomato plants will probably freeze and die. So it's, you can try it, but it's kind of a roll of the dice about how successful you're going to be. I'm of course, if you live further south, they grow tomatoes all winter long down there in southwest Florida commercially. So I'm all depends on where you live. A tomato plant, Bill. Pardon me? I'm, <laughs> I'm growing a tomato plant. Not on purpose at all. Let's go back to that compost that we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a tomato growing out of it. That happens. Yes. Uh, I here, and I thought, well, if you freeze, you freeze. Hopefully, maybe we'll get something from you. <laughs> And with strawberries, Corey points out that you could put that when you order the plants, you could put the plants in the refrigerator to cold stratify them. And that way, when you plant them, they're going to flower and give you strawberries, hopefully even earlier. So you can push them a little bit. But yeah, Elin, you're right that they seem to be in the market and farmers markets at the store even earlier. So. Yeah, that was thinking. Did we get a cold cold front earlier this year? I've just so I just feel like it moved about one month in advance. Well, they're always trying to breed new varieties to get even bigger strawberries that taste better, higher sugar content, and probably that produce earlier and longer. Mm -hmm. Because I had Dr. Whitaker on, who is the University of Florida strawberry breeder. And he did a class here um, on Zoom with me about a year or two ago. It's still online. Oh my gosh, it's gotten like 50,000 views, I think, on wow. YouTube. So it's my best performing video. <laughs> but I mean, he's the expert on it. You know, he breeds strawberries. So gosh, he can tell homeowners how to go about growing them. And he um, was great. He had a great time. Nice. Oh, yeah. And he talked about white strawberries, didn't he? Mm -hmm. I was going to <laughs> ask. <it>. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I went to a research center, also saw the white strawberries. And uh, I think it was uh, Monday, I went to the grocery store and I saw the white strawberries there. I was You're so new, attempt yeah. to buy it. I haven't. <laughs> I want to know how it tastes like. They taste just like other strawberries. That would be a weird sensation. Your brain could not quite comprehend, mm -hmm. I don't think, you know. So a very colorful addition to a fruit tray, I would think. Yes, that's true. See, uh, we always so circle back to into sharing so recipes that, right? and talking about poop on here for some reason. I don't know why. What now? We weren't even talking about poop anymore. Where do we get that? <laughs> We're back on recipes now. <laughs> yeah, oh, okay. Recipes, yes. So, hey, guys, if anybody has any last minute questions here, feel free to put them in the chat. And if you need to contact our office, there is our phone number. If you call today, you will probably, the phone will probably be answered by Teresa. And if she can't help you out, we do have a master gardener volunteer there today, Bernie, and she'll just patch you right through to him. And he can answer your questions over the phone or through email. Or if you want to go and visit the office, we're open. I'm not there, but they're there. And Bernie's more than happy to look at whatever kind of lawn and garden and plant and turf grass problem you have and help you figure it out he's really good at that may i do a quick plug in <laughs> you go right ahead yeah because you mentioned turf grass all of a sudden it just clicked because next wednesday i will do a webinar of um uh, about winter okay for it a winter landscape maintenance it yeah this is uh like i always get these questions ask about why it looks like this like mm -hmm. your my grass what has patches is grown or uh, you know all this and that questions about landscape in florida's winter so that just came then i organized this webinar it will be next wednesday it's hosted on water wednesday water wednesday platform from 2 p.m to 3 p.m and i invited two very knowledgeable horticulture agents in tampa bay region and they will give you some tips and how to properly maintain your landscape in florida winter so we'll tell you like because just like i think bill already mentioned that when you see your plants 
they don't look good. You add a lot of water and you add more fertilizers、mm-hmm. and hoping they will look better. So that's actually it's not real. It's not recommended in our winter time. So to have a pretty yard, don't miss this webinar. I will drop the link in the、oh, comment section. I already put the link to your Facebook page. Oh, nice!、Comments. Thank you.、Mm-hmm. I will share that as well.、But、definitely visit Yilin's Facebook and like it and follow it. And she does online classes also. She does a lot of Facebook Live, as do we. We need to do more Facebook Live, Lily. I like your platform.、Mm-hmm. I like it. I'm going to use that. Part of it's a learning curve for me, but it's just so pretty. It just、I、takes practice. I was thinking of a Facebook Live at the landfill with Carbon Carmen and Leafy Lily, and talking about what is what what will teach the kids, but what is considered greens, what is considered browns to put in, and then have a, another session of compost or trash, <laughs> you know, and where where do you put it? <laughs> which is which? Which container do you put it in? Yeah, exactly. Nice. And there's Lily's email. If you have any really, really difficult questions, please be sure to send them to her. And she forwards them right back to Bill. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I need to. I need to fix my email and put some kind of blocker on or something. <laughs> or she calls him, so we can hash it out. Believe it or not, we spend a lot of time actually talking about this kind of stuff. Because nobody else will listen to us, so you know we got to talk to each other about this kind of stuff. Oh, we have a pruning question. Spring must be getting here soon. So, question from Monique: I'm really wanting to trim my plumbago. Can I do it now or too early? I wait. You can wait, but you know plumbagos are really, really durable plants. If you have they're, an otherwise healthy plumbago that's doing、yeah. well. They're, they're, I know they grow really fast, and they if they're grow if they're in a spot where they're happy, they're going to need pretty frequent pruning. That's one of the more one of the faster growing plants in your landscape.、Um, it would not kill it or hurt it to do it now, but as a general rule, if you wait until the beginning of March, when ideally all the freezes and frosts are over and done with, you can go out there and prune everything back for the whole year all at once. All on one weekend or one day, depending on how big, how much you have in your yard. So、That's、I find it's a lot easier to go out there once a year and prune the heck out of everything and get it to where you want it to be, ideally smaller than where you ideally want it to be, and then it has the room and the freedom to grow back through the spring, the summer, and everything. I don't prune everything in my yard every week or every month. I do it maybe once a year or so. Ides of March, make your Ides of March the、uh, pruning day. <laughs> exactly. I have a question. I have to ask that it's a because we're on the topic of pruning, so it's about the crepe myrtle.、Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask. My, I have a pretty tree in front of my yard, and all my neighbors have a stick in front of their yard. <laughs> You're doing the right thing. So it's、uh, I've been having these conversations with them, but it's just they are like, oh, you just hack it down, and they will come back next year. They do next year. I'm trying to let them know it's over time. Your tree may not come back,、mm-hmm. but I don't know how to get that message across. They do it because everybody else does it. Exactly. Um, and and know, yeah, they have sticks, and they look like this. They look like, why did you do this? They、um, found. <laughs> That when you prune them back and just remove last year's flowers and seeds and dead branches, just clean them up a little bit and prune them back very, very lightly, they flower the best. You're going to get the most flowers next summer,、what、and、happened? that's what people are growing them for is for the flowers. Any time?、Mm-hmm. Oh, excuse me. At what time to do that? No, you can do any any time.、Mm-hmm. Okay. February, generally before they start growing. Back again before they start leaping out. But what we we actually maybe you know what we need to replay that video we made. We、uh, do. Uh, me doing mine, <laughs> and what we generally did is all the twiggy, anything smaller than a pencil, you know, you can take out any crossing branches. Go ahead and prune those. Take the suckers off the bottom, 
And like he said, you can take those calyxes off. Don't do, you don't have to. And that's really all you have to do. And now Bill's boss, Jim Davis, ran an experiment in his own yard with three crate myrtles. The experiment of the three crate myrtles. One, he hat racked, that's what we call it. <laughs> Just, you know, he cut it all down, made it look like you can put your hat on it. Um, the other, he pruned the way I just described, you know, just kind of clean up kind of pruning. The other, he did nothing Two. So the results of the experiment is the best flowering one was that middle one that he did that clean up pruning to. The second best was the one he did nothing <laughs> to. The one, you know, they do produce bigger flowers when you do that, but not as many. But a crepe myrtle can have beautiful winter form and have a beautiful trunk and be gorgeous in the winter, even when it's naked, if you don't keep hacking at it. And then all you really get each year is basal cell, new whippy kind of growth. And over time, it does affect the lifespan of the tree. Now we see all that the uh, commercial areas, they're doing that. And you got to consider they have, you know, four guys who has to get an entire community in a certain amount of time. So they're just going to do the most efficient. Do, 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 do. Does it matter to them that those trees will have to be replaced in eight or 10 years? No. <laughs> but you in your own yard, you can be more of a concierge kind of caretaker. Oh. Of those <laughs> it looks just so sad, all the sticks. Yeah. <laughs> They do look I sad. Picture once of a row of them like that. I call them moaning myrtles. <laughs> but the problem is, people will plant a crepe myrtle and they'll plant a variety that naturally wants to get forty feet tall. And that is a very. And they put it in a spot where it doesn't have anywhere near that much room, oh. so they have to hack it way back to keep it from blocking a sidewalk or driveway or the front door or you know something like that. So very important if you're going to put a crepe myrtle in, go out there and look and find the right variety that's going to get to the right mature height. And, they have and then all you got to do is just trim it up a little bit lightly, remove the old seed heads, the crossing branches, dead branches, and that's it. Uh, I've seen people who have to go out there with a chainsaw to prune their crepe myrtles, and that's too much work. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> My crepe myrtle is not looking all that great right now. And I think because what happened is one year I did not prune it. Mm. And, you know, I just ignored it. So then I didn't like its look the next year. So then trying to fix it, I ended up somewhat uh. over pruning it. So now it's, you know, kind of really, yeah, <laughs> looking. So I'm going to have to get back to that medium, just cleaning it out and then trying to get it you know, one level <laughs> without over pruning it. So the moral of that story is I never should have stopped the medium amount of pruning routine. That's, I think it's when you keep it on a good routine. So mm -hmm. it usually show the results are usually better. Or if you, it's time to replace your crepe myrtle, you might want to consider another type of possibly even a native tree that's going to attract a lot more pollinators for you than your crepe myrtle will. Just a thought out there. <laughs> and let me share our Facebook page link with everybody. And also remind everybody that our master gardeners have a nursery that is located over on Oliver Street. That's the little street that runs right behind the Hernando County Fairgrounds. It's the same street that Animal Control is on, if you're familiar with it. And they are there every Wednesday and Saturday morning from about nine in the morning until noon. So right now, because the weather is nice, they're there until noon. During the summer when it gets really hot, they leave at 11. So they do change their hours. I'm gonna be there Saturday because I have a tree to pick up. I may be there Saturday. I still don't know yet if I can be. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I need to email them and let them know today, I suppose. <laughs> so I don't see any other questions in the comments. Let me double check here real quick. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody for tuning in. We'll be back here again next Thursday. 
I'm going to try to get another guest for next Thursday, but I don't know who it's going to be yet. So it'll be a surprise <laughs> guest, I guess. We'll just, hey, we'll see who shows you up. You have to look oh, into some that. of those um, GPI people that came to the Master Gardener training that you had yesterday and talk about um, some of the invasive insects they're on the lookout for. I bet you they would love to come because they always are trying to get more people aware of um, invasive insects. And if they see them or think they see one, you know, getting the word to you so you can get it to them and they can see if they need to do a survey of that area. So. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Um, I'll reach out to them. I'm not sure if they can or not, but I'll reach out to them and ask them. Or maybe get someone like Lyle Boss somebody on sure we could have somebody on every week you know i could have as many as 10 people on here so we could start having eight guests every week how's that <laughs> wow the screen starts to look a little crowded i think after a certain point it might be a little bit difficult to uh see it will be our virtual hangout time i like it <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, I started questions about native trees. <laughs> okay, here, we're going to squeeze in. We're going to squeeze in two more questions really quick. So Sean asked about what is the best low-maintenance native tree? That is, you can, there's no one answer for that. Depends on your site, you know, and on your site conditions and all of that. Um, I would find, well... Florida Friendly Landscaping has an app um, that you, it's it's basically the um, plant guide in app form. So that is helpful if you go to um, IFAS, I-F-A-S, you know, dot U-F-L. There you go. Or email me <laughs> and I can get email you. Email Lily. She'll get, she'll get a copy to you. Yeah. And it's a, and then it's a you, list so of all you the plants that are going to do best in Florida. Most native trees are pretty low maintenance, but you just, once they're established, but it depends on what you're looking for, what size you're looking for, what your site conditions are, all of that. They're, you know, so similar to crate myrtles. I knew they were going to say that. <laughs> um, a chase tree. We have native hollies that do well. We do have a native plum tree that mm -hmm. does well. And it flowers in the spring, gets lots of white flowers on it. Very, very pretty. A chase so tree. You look up purple. It's called Chickasaw Plum or Hog Plum. It has a couple of different names. Native oh. Florida Plum. Yeah. And. Oh, Cindy's asking about the palms dying. Yes, there is a disease for not all palm trees, but certain species of palms called uh, lethal bronzing. And it has been here in Florida for a number of years and every year becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger problem because when you're driving down I-75 and you get to an interchange and you see all the palm trees are dead, everybody starts to notice. They're like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Why did all those palm trees die? It's because of lethal bronzing. It's a disease that they do not have a treatment or a cure for yet. It's spread by a very, very tiny little insect that goes from tree to tree. And if your palm tree gets it, there's nothing you do. There's no uh, insecticide or fungicide or spray or anything you could do to fix the palm tree. It's for cabbage palms. That's what it's attacking. Cabbage mm -hmm. palms, Sylvester palms. Queen palms can get it, although I have not seen a queen palm get it. It's happened in the villages and other areas. And... Canary Island date palms, get it. Pretty we common. Have, we're watching a restaurant being built right next to our building here. And they're at the landscaping part. Guess what they have put in? What? What kind? Cabbage palms in the back and queen palms in the front. <laughs> and they're keeping the queens like this. I don't know how long they're going to keep them up like that or what the purpose is for that. But apparently that's what the landscapers said to do. Do they have the wooden braces on them? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, they'll probably forget that. And they'll be there 10 years from now. The braces will be growing into the palms. And, and Sean, have one last comment there that Chase Tree has beautiful flowers. And that's that's a 
good uh, suggestion. I'm Shades not sure if it's negative. I'm, I'm not going to go, you know, I wouldn't say in front of a judge that it's native. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I'm not going to swear to it either, yeah. but it's a good it's a good choice mm -hmm. for a small tree. Does small well in Central right. Florida. We're right here in Hernando County. We're kind of the southern range where they do well. Mm -hmm. So, hey, guys, with that, once again, thank you so much for tuning in. And I'll be back next Thursday. Lily should be back next Thursday. And we'll probably have other people with us back here next Thursday. Gilin, thank you so much for, for joining in here. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yes, we'll have to have you back more often. Hey, whenever you're free, shoot me an email, and I can send you the link, and you can join in. And I mean, like I said, we can get 10 people on here in the morning. Right here. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. I will come back. <laughs> Great. That would be wonderful. And I will share the um, program that you're going to have next Wednesday because I actually had somebody come to my library class, um, which was protecting pollinators from the cold, and they somehow were misinformed that it was protecting lawns from the cold. So they were unhappy with <laughs> the subject matter but i told him when we had lots of classes on that i just wasn't talking about that right then so we'll make That's sure great. I can post yay that. thank you mm -hmm. i hope to see everyone here on water wednesday too yes yeah everybody tune in for water wednesday and <laughs> thanks again and we'll see all of you again next week bye bye, -bye. bye.